Hello, fellow franchiseateers. Welcome to the No Franchise Fatigue podcast, the podcast where we do lengthy montages of preparation, flexing our imaginary muscles, only to sneakily infiltrate and decimate our favorite cinematic franchises in the most celebratory fashion. My name is Matt, and I am once again joined by my increasingly heroic co-host, Sean. How are you doing this evening, Sean? Uh, they drew first blood. They did. <laughs> they well, drew blood. They, they drew first blood. Um, I feel like we should start off a little bit before we dig into each of these entries into the Rambo franchise. First of all, we are going to be going into spoiler territory. So for anybody out there who has not seen the Rambo films, just keep that in mind that we will be digging into some plot points and some elements, uh, you know, especially in a franchise, right? Because we have to talk about the next film that we're going to probably spoil the ending to the one prior, but, um, one of those franchises that's so in the DNA of Western action films, it's almost impossible to at least not be aware. Absolutely. I mean, it got to the point where Sylvester Stallone was even like mocking it in his other films. Tango and Cash has one of the funniest Rambo jokes in it. The Rambo character had become such a an American stereotype that, you know, they make fun of him in Gremlins 2. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on! Like it, it's such an it's such a fascinating uh, phenomenon, particularly as we start to dig into this franchise. About as you're right, it's such an ingrained character and storyline in action cinema in pop culture that it's something that when we first were talking about doing this, uh, particularly because the the latest Rambo film has just come out, that you know I almost didn't want to do it because I felt like everyone has probably seen them all. And what kind of what could we say that would be, you know, a fresh take on it? And then, of course, the new film came out. And I thought to myself that we definitely need to talk about this franchise because (laughs) this is a franchise that has had to change with the times. And it has both changed and not changed with the times. And I think that's a fascinating thing to kind of analyze in a franchise as we go. I think we should also start because it because it is ingrained into the DNA of America. And I think we should probably start. I mean, what is your, you know, first approach to the Rambo franchise and the Rambo character? So, as I've mentioned before, and I will definitely mention many times over the course of this podcast, my father did not have the world's greatest sense of age appropriateness. So... (laughs) I'm I don't, no fathers did at that period. I feel like that was just, it was just, you know, a free for all in terms of that thing. Right. Yeah. It was definitely that kid in class that got to see all the R rated movies, much to my teacher's dismay. Cause I would be describing them in great <laughs> detail, but um, like, like they were urban legends. Right. I don't know if it was like that. That's what it was like for me. It'd be like, yeah, you know what? And there's this man with a hook for a hand and bees in his chest, you know, like it was, it was its own uh, recess schoolyard kind of mythology. So, so um, one of my earliest cinematic memories period, bearing in mind my age is seeing Rambo three in theaters. Now I was young enough that I don't remember seeing the whole movie. It's one of those things I only remember, you know, blips and bits. Although the, part that always sticks out to me is when he uh sets that tree branch on fire and cauterizes the wound i remember that i have a memory of seeing that as a you know four-year-old child so yeah and i mean it was also something like you know my family we grew up with this that we watched first blood and and first blood rambo first blood part two ironically were you know bootlegged on the same tape in my household so you would watch them always watch them back to back like my brother and i would watch first blood and then we would watch rambo first blood part two back to back you would just sit there and you would watch for three hours and that's what you did you watched these double features in our household and the rambo franchise was one of them we watched them over and over again on vhs weird side note i had one of those always double feature things but you want wide disparity the 80s transformers cartoon movie and stand by me (laughs) (laughs) they're both kids movies right right it was the 80s i mean that's how we justified it which we will be talking about later is how the 80s justified you know kids animation so we're gonna we'll we'll talk about that later as we kind of dig into things but you know i i do think that this is an 
it's a strange franchise in a lot of ways and it's but because it is so ingrained into pop culture it's something that i think we need to you know in 20 2019 2020 we need to start looking back at these things and understand kind of how these franchises develop and i think that this is a really good one to kind of take a look at so yeah why don't uh, let's start off why don't we just jump right in and let's look at uh first blood so Stallone in a second signature franchise plays John Rambo, a Vietnam war vet visiting one of his unit buddies in the Pacific Northwest. After discovering his friend is dead, Rambo decides to hit a diner on his way out of town, but is waylaid by Sheriff Teasel who tries to run Rambo out of town for vagrancy. Rambo refuses to be intimidated. And when he tries to walk back into town is immediately arrested His subsequent treatment at the hand of the police triggers John's PTSD, and he escapes, declaring war on the town. Eventually, his old CO Troutman comes to try and talk Rambo down, which he successfully does after John says his piece in what is truly one of, if not the greatest monologue of Sly's career, talking about how veterans are treated, especially Vietnam vets. Though John famously dies in the book, Stallone notoriously didn't like that, leading to the ending that the movie has now and the franchise we all know. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. I mean, I, I as I was watching this, I was actually watching, I rewatched First Blood this late last week. I watched it with my family. I felt like this is a film that my family, it impacted my family a lot in a lot of ways. but as I was rewatching it with them, you know, there was a lot of comments about like that this film was really impactful for a lot of people. And, and so early in Sly Stallone's career, you know, he, like you said, he had a major franchise on hand with in Rocky, not only just a franchise, like a wildly popular franchise, but one that won Oscars, you know, for, for him, for, you know, not as an actor, which is still a writer for God's sake. I, I I feel like him not winning an Oscar at this point is kind of a blight on the Oscars, but that's probably just coming from a genre fan. And that, the genre fan, one of many. <laughs> right. So I first blood for me is is kind of a water watershed moment. I mean, it, it comes out in 1982. Mm-hmm. And it's an interesting blend because I think First Blood is one of those movies that indicates the changing structure between 1970 cinema and 1980 cinema yeah because first and foremost um it's almost hard to call this an action movie by modern standards it's certainly an action movie by 70s standards but by modern standards this really reads more as a drama yeah and it's super and unlike the further sequels as we'll get into them this first one is really realistic Absolutely. It's, As a matter of fact, uh, Morell famously, <laughs> Morell wrote this book after seeing how Vietnam veterans were treated in society. This was treated as backlash. Rambo certainly has a higher kill count in the book, and including himself, frankly, because it wouldn't be an episode of this podcast if we didn't touch on suicide. <laughs> Yeah, that's becoming a weird theme that we've got going on here. So, But by and large, obviously, the major themes of this are, well, a major theme, because this was in the day where a movie could have just one laser sharp focus. And that is the same intent as the book, ultimately different ending aside. And that is the treatment of veterans, especially Vietnam veterans the the speech the monologue at the end lays it out very very specifically you know he was spit on uh he was called a baby killer he was called you know homeless he couldn't even grab a cheeseburger in this town without getting tortured like literally tortured well i mean sprayed with a fire hose but they weren't nice about it well and they they beat him there's a scene where the one of the deputies starts hitting him with a nightstick To get him to, you know, there's certainly an element to that. And I mean, in the film, a literal PTSD flashback And this movie's very, very honest about that to him having been tortured by the North Vietnamese and rocking the most 70s mustache ever, by the way, in that flashback. (laughs) Yeah. And it's just brief, too. It's just brief. And you're like, oh, 
is just boy is that a porn stash <laughs> that's so funny yeah i mean i mean the treatment of ptsd in this movie is really fascinating because depending on how you want to view this film because this film does as you said it's got a theme to it and it's a semi-political theme for a mm-hmm. film you know and which is you know kind of as as I stated before, this movie is kind of one of those bridge films from the 1970s to the 1980s. In the 1970s, you had a lot of social political action films, right? You had Dog Day Afternoon, um, things like that, which had messages to them. They were message films. Um, A lot of them were socially conscious films. They had things to say outside of just being action films. And then in the 1980s, you, you shed a lot of that. A lot of that because of the me generation, because of, you know, uh, a rise and a focus on self, which is exemplified by even how Sly Stallone looks as the films progress. And, and, uh, you know, that's something I wanted to talk about as we get so going. First movie, he's just a guy. He looks like a drifter. He looks like a vet, honestly. Yeah. And I mean, he's fit in it, but you know, as, as my family pointed out, he's incredibly gaunt in that movie. He's really thin and wiry. They very much portray him as a, as you know, almost like his real height. <laughs> he's kind of a, he's not an, an extraordinarily tall gentleman, and you know, there's a, as as funny as it is. Um, my mother made the comment. They're like, she was like, oh, you know, Sylvester Stallone's kind of a, a short guy when David Caruso is taller than he is. <laughs> By the way, speaking of an incredibly young David Caruso. Right, right. In, a, in kind of a side, in a small side role, who's got a couple of good lines um, and a, a couple of one liners. He's, and he's the one that's like, oh, no, you don't want to mess with him. He was a ranger. Yeah, he's like, great, great. You know, and he's, <laughs> he's got kind of the sarcastic side to him uh, for kind of a small role. But I like that they present so Sylvester. Much. We're talking about actors, uh, uh, Brian Dennehy, also very, very good in his role. The character is a dick, but as an actor he's phenomenal in the movie absolutely he i mean he exemplifies like kind of the overreach and arrogance of somebody who grew up in a small town of of kind of that small town mentality right um and so i think i mean his he's so good at it he's so good as a villain in it the the comparison to how he was treated by the vietnamese is interesting and I really, it's funny because it draws a parallel that you wouldn't otherwise draw. It's because it's subtle. It's not, you know, the cops, if you look at it from their perspective throughout the movie, you can see why what's happening is happening. Does that make it justifiable? No, but there is a logical thought train there. Yeah. Yeah, Um, Yeah. And frankly, Rambo's response follows a logical thought train as well, extreme as it is, because they are not treating him right. And he is a man with extreme PTSD that should probably be, you know, at least talking to somebody, if not medicated. And I don't mean that in any, you know, teasing way. One of the reasons these movies were very impactful for me as a child is my father was a military man. And I grew up as a military brat on a base. So, you know, I mean, I literally saw Rambo 3 on a military base. Yeah. And and that brings up a good point. You know, the, you know, I, as growing up watching this, this movie, this is the first movie I remember where they kind of showed PTSD in a way that was actually really effective and thoughtful to me. Sympathetic. Um, yeah. Sympathetic. You, you don't, you know, Brian Dennehy plays a villain, you know, even though Rambo is the one that's essentially going on this kind of extreme spree, but you don't blame him in this movie. This is a movie where nobody's to blame you much, know, in a lot of ways. Much to Rambo's benefit in the movie, he doesn't actively kill anybody. Uh, one police officer does die, but there's no way to call it anything but self-defense on Johnny's part. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it that's a note that that needs to be made is that he actually doesn't actively kill anybody. And I I think that his struggle as he's going through. And there's also this really interesting kind of parallel where he's being chased through the woods, you know, but he also has to kind of fight off nature 
mm-hmm. the cold and the water and there's the, the scene where he's on the cliff face and he has to jump to the tree as the helicopter's trying to kind of get a clear shot at him and stuff like that and there's this idea that like it's all survival you know so, it so he they uh call in the military as well um because one has to remember this is an era that was pre police having military grade weaponry so the national guard is literally called in in this film as well yeah even though this police force is probably the most well-armed police force for a small town my god it certainly is (laughs) they've got like uh, you know automatic rifles and all of that like at their disposal i mean which is shown in the beginning because the you know uh john rambo actually sees that he sees them locking up the cabinet when he's in the police station being arrested uh with all their weapons and i think that's a fascinating choice i mean there's also a lot of police officers for a small town (laughs) you know and then they start calling people out from the outside like you said now the the national guard and things like that yeah I the national you bring up a good point with the national guard. I think the national guard is a fascinating point in this film, particularly because a lot of that sequence is played as comedic, mm-hmm. and you know, as you know, my brother and I were kind of discussing this film. That's the one scene he doesn't like is the national guard scene because it's played for comedic. He thinks it's it's totally against the rest of the film, even though it kind of shows that you know how much ahead of everybody else Rambo is yeah. <laughs> as a one man army, how much further he is uh, above everything. And that scene is really interesting, you know, with the, with the grenade launcher and, and them kind of bickering between each other where he's like telling them to go into the cave and they're like, no, you know, <laughs> without, without uh, skipping ahead at all. This movie is the most realistic about him being a one man army as well, though, because in this film, it is not superior armament. It's not because he's so badass he fires a gun and seven people drop. It's literally a movie that plays up his superior tactical ability. And it's definitely portrayed as being almost more because he saw real combat than the training in and of itself, which is what I think the point of the National Guard is in the film. Is it's people with equivalent training but not equivalent experience. Absolutely. Theory. I mean, he was a ranger, special forces, so it's not equivalent training, but he, he, yeah. the parallel yeah. I'm drawing, you see. No, absolutely. Yeah, I'm picking up what you're throwing down there uh, in those terms. And I think that that's an important point to make. Um, and this this is a guy who's he's a survivor, you know, and I think that's something that's really interesting. And and as the films go, they they kind of lose that tone of him being a survivor in those regards. But um you know, he's, he's in America. He's, you know, he ends up at odds against, you know, a local police force and, and all of that. And so you get this idea that he really is, feels like he's on his own, particularly because you mentioned in your synopsis that he goes to visit his friend in the opening sequence and his friend has passed away and his friend has passed away from cancer. Mm -hmm. And the lady that tells him that, um, you know, blames like agent orange you know, for it. And she says, she makes the comment, which is a really kind of heartbreaking comment that he, at the end, she could pick him up by herself. Mm. That that's how kind of wasted away he was. And so, and you get this idea. And as you mentioned, that there's this great monologue at the end, which I think we should touch on here in a second, but that this idea of this, this guy who trained with Rambo. So you get the idea that he's probably the same as Rambo was, had simply wasted away and nobody cared. Nobody seemed to know. Even when he showed up, they were like, Oh yeah, he died months ago and nobody cared to tell anybody and nobody cared. And, and that it's a weirdly intimate kind of place that he goes into more detail about like how they were spit on as soldiers. But he was, he was buried in the yard. If I remember right. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't even have a a plot. He was literally buried on the family's land. Yeah. And it's, and I think that's what makes First Blood such an interesting movie, particularly as we go into the rest of this franchise. It's a somber film. Oh, it's there's a, yeah, there's a melancholy to it. It's a, as you said, it's an action film, but it's not an action film. You know, there's some great chases, and and, and by God, the helicopter wreck is fantastic in it. The oh, motorcycle when chase when he finally grabs the machine gun and unleashes in the town. Yeah, amazing. Yeah. Super- shot like 
the effects work is on point. Like the early eighties was the era for those kinds of effects. Yeah. And I think this movie succeeds on, on all of those factors. And it's, it's hard for me to like, you know, I get it because Rambo became an icon and he doesn't really become an icon, the icon that we all know him for. Like that's, that's buried in the pop culture until much later. But it's, it's interesting to see that the beginning of this franchise lies so heavily in a dramatic piece that and rest in peace uh richard krenna but definitely should have mentioned troutman here too who is yeah. fantastic yeah. fantastic character who remains through the majority of this franchise thank god he's one of the better parts of it absolutely he's phenomenal in this and he's got a weirdly good chemistry with with sylvester stallone despite the fact that they're not on screen very much together in this film Later on, you get to see them much more they're together. At odds for most of this film. Yeah, they're at odds, and so but there's that great scene where Richard Crenna is talking about after the National Guard blows up the mine, and, and Rambo's now trapped in the mine, but they just assume he's dead. They're like, nobody can survive this. And Richard Crenna gives this thing where he's like, I can see like the headlines now, you know, Green Beret, you know, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, you know, killed in Jerkwater, USA. He's got this great like sarcastic jab in it about like how the how the police have treated this entire situation. And it just goes to show like how good he is in this film. Um, And he's the one person who's there. He's the one person who understands John Rambo. And he's the one person there that's Rambo doesn't have a lot of dialogue in this movie. Well, he's the one person who's on Rambo's side. They brought him in to talk Rambo down but he does it with sympathy because he was there. Yeah. And and so that's what makes the final scene so good. The scene when he's finally in the town and he's he's blowing things up left and right out of like a sheer rage, out of a survival instinct that has kicked in inside of him. Something that he was trained to be as a second behavior. This is what he's doing. And then it's, it is Troutman that comes in and talks with them. And this is where you get that fantastic monologue that's delivered by Sly Stallone, which... I have a lot of friends that think that that scene is not good. And I don't understand by any means. They're like, I don't understand what he's saying. He's just blubbering. And I'm like, I feel like they miss the entire emotional impact of that scene because of his destroy an entire town. And now he's finally breaking down emotionally. That's the point. Right. And absolutely. And I think Sylvester Stallone nails that scene he becomes this mess. It's a stream of consciousness. This monologue doesn't even have a lot of structure to it. It's a stream of consciousness, not monologue where he starts off talking about how he came home to a new war, which is a phrase he uses in, in first blood part two, but he came home to a different kind of war, a silent war, you know, on that he felt against people that, you know, he just wanted people to, he wanted this, you know, he wanted people to love the soldiers as much as the soldiers loved America. You know, mm-hmm. and and he makes that that comment. He says, "Yeah." He tells the story as he's going in this monologue. He starts off, you know, talking about the, you know, how he was treated and how they were treated, and he didn't understand. And, you know, he did what had to be done. One of the ones I always love is, I mean, love. You know what I mean? But uh, one of the lines that always impacts me very strongly is when he says, "You know, they trusted me with million dollar equipment." And here I can't even get a job as a goddamn mechanic. And it's really heart wrenching. Yeah. And he throws something, he throws his gun against the wall at that point, And like, it's, it's really heartbreaking. And by the time he gets to the end of it, he's only telling the story about his friend who died over there, who was killed by um, a little kid who was carrying a, a bomb that detonated and how his friend wanted to drive a Chevy. And he, was covered in his friend and he's like, and his friend was like, Oh yeah, we can, we can make it. And he's like, I can't even find your legs, you know? And it's just this, the way he tells it is such a visceral way. And it's in a, he's literally just pouring out his emotion. And I think that it's, again, I going back to where we started, I think Sylvester Stallone should have won an Oscar by now. He -hmm. should have won a pity Oscar by now because they didn't give it to him for Rocky as an actor. And they didn't give it to him for this as an actor. And I think that's a shame. And they, to him for creed they, yeah they didn't give it to him for creed and he was fantastic and that's when they should have because he was nominated for best supporting actor given that pity oscar if you're willing to give paul newman a pity oscar for color of money which is a terrible film yeah. then you should at least have given him that and i don't understand 
why at this point they didn't. Because just between Rocky and First Blood, he deserves it. I mean, not to put a hat on a hat, but it is just the only movie in the franchise that is this rawly emotional and it deserves to be regarded in a different way than the rest of the movies in this franchise. I'm not one of those pretentious types who differentiates films and movies, but if I were, I would say First Blood is the only film in the franchise. Absolutely. And it's, it's also like, and, and I think at this point we should probably move on to, to Rambo first blood part two, but the, I think that you're absolutely right that if, you know, when we started discussing, let's doing us doing the Rambo franchise, you know, we try to split it up so that we're doing three to four movies each episode. And this one, we're going to be tackling five. And part of it is, is that the only way for me to kind of split it up as a franchise is one and then the rest. Yeah. And that doesn't really make sense for how we kind of format our, our podcast, but you know, it's, it's a fascinating thing because this film is, it's, it's a film that you can watch on its own. It's a complete story. It's a fantastic story. It's a, it's a movie where I, I, at the end, I always get teary eyed. And then of course the really, really terrible eighties pop song comes on over the credits. Kind of... <laughs> and the very, very end where he's being uh, perp walked out of the police station by Troutman, where we learn does the Rambo theme have lyrics? Yes, it does. <laughs> <laughs> I know, and and uh, and I, I feel like we're remiss because this there's two, there's two other things to First Blood that I think are fantastic, and one of them is not that song. <laughs> um, that's, uh, but the first one is the score. John Williams comes in, drops the score. It's a phenomenal score, and yeah. then also the cinematography. The song without lyrics is great, and yes, the cinematography is amazing. Yeah, it's got this gloomy feel to it. Using the Pacific Northwest is fantastic for the tone of the film. They kind of embrace this idea of that kind of that foggy look, that kind of gray and green look. Um, Phenomenal choice. And the uh, small town kind of mentality that existed there in a way it doesn't exist east. Because it's still, I mean, to this day, as someone that came from uh, Seattle most recently before moving to L.A., it's still a lot of you know country out there yeah yeah and i think that's a it's a really strong choice i think at the end of this podcast we will go through and rank all these films but i think it's pretty safe to say that first blood is not only the best film of this franchise but it might be one of the best action films ever made absolutely it's certainly one of the if it's certainly a short list for one of the best movies of the 80s period yeah yeah absolutely So, which does bring us on to moving on to the next film, which is Rambo First Blood Part 2. And this will be the first film where we make fun of the titling of this series. So, let me be the first to say that this is a stupid fucking title. Um, (laughs) I'm just going to be straightforward. I mean, I get it. They wanted to put Rambo on there because this he became kind of a hero, a hero for the for the masses with the first film and the success of the first film. And so they're like, we need to kind of trademark his name. So they wanted to put it on there. Rambo first blood part two is mm-hmm. 19, 1985 comes out three years after the, the first one, after the success of the first one, we, we find ourselves with John Rambo, who is now working in the rock quarry, which I think is a very convenient way for them to get him buffed up a little bit. <laughs> so He's uh, in the rock quarry and here comes Troutman. Troutman says, you know what? I always said there was going to be a way for me to get you out and I've got a way. We need you to go into Thailand and um, be part of a rescue mission for some of the prisoners of war from Vietnam. So Rambo then proceeds to accept the mission, goes into Thailand. He is told that his mission is simply to take pictures to prove the existence of these prisoners of war in Thailand uh, that are being held there. And, um, you know, in uh, true 80s action fashion, decides taking pictures is not enough and proceeds to uh, try to rescue the prisoners of war himself. I mean, this movie's pretty straightforward. Yeah, although interestingly co-written by james cameron very early in his career <laughs> with sylvester stallone <laughs> with Sylvester Stallone. so it's an interesting movie to discuss on the level of it doesn't add a lot of thematic elements per se but it does 
evolve the general theme of the treatment of the soldiers in the sense that he's told to only take pictures and not rescue anyone is absolutely berated for (laughs) disagreeing with that and ultimately finds out the plan is to cover it up so it is an evolved theme of the treatment of soldiers as political pawns and especially in charles napier's murdoch and the cover-up policy which again maybe not as good a film dramatically but actually a really good role uh, murdoch is a great very hateable character yeah kind of following in the, in the footsteps of dennehy and the other police officers in the first film that he comes in as as this kind of bureaucrat, um, this part of the system that has consistently overlooked veterans and the soldiers in a lot of ways. Um, you're right. There's this this entire uh, subplot about the cover up. It's interesting that they give him a lot of henchmen and don't do a lot with them in terms of the villains, since we're kind of talking about that in those regards. But you know, you're absolutely right. There's a kind of evolved theme about the treatment of veterans of the war and this idea that they they were hoping to not find anyone because yeah. if they did find somebody it became a political nightmare for them and so it's interesting that that that's what this film kind of takes it and i unfortunately i think that that's kind of as far as it gets in terms of like really running with that theme outside of that plot and you know and yeah. rambo's because resistance as started as first blood part two is as an action movie and i think there are definitely a couple of other things to note it's not an especially complicated one you do have a love interest for rambo in the character of ko who's his guide initially but about 20 seconds after she's officially a love interest she just gets wasted <laughs> it is i you know i love action films i love 80s action films i this movie gets a lot of love from fans of the franchise in a lot of ways i don't necessarily share that love and i think and part of that is is that you have this an interesting story about the cover-up that's not taken where it needs to go you have a ham-fisted love story that's just jammed in there for the sake of jamming it in there yeah it's it's literally there to give rambo some kind of an arc that isn't the exact same arc as the first film which speaking that's, of a hat on a hat, he's already motivated to rescue these soldiers. Yeah. And it's, you know, he has this love interest that's yeah, and I don't think I don't know. I don't think she's particularly good in this movie, um, in those regards. It, part of it is is that I don't think she's given a lot to work with. She's she's a thin character. She has uh it's one of those characters that also has really really bad bad english like her character has broke speaks broken english but it's very obvious that it's like a person like intentionally trying to write broken english (laughs) (laughs) like there's no naturalism to it and then and and it's also interesting that this is the first time that they bring in the russians yep which that at that point in the 80s that was just inevitable frankly 1985 man that it was going to happen that they were going to bring in the russians it, it was it was a political topic that was there yeah. so yeah it makes sense i get it but it's also like you've it's spoken- again another plot that's just half half there and you've definitely spoken well to rambo's weaknesses rambo first blood part two since we actually have to specifically make that distinction um <laughs> One thing I will give this movie is they don't fully dive into ridiculous action territory yet. So the scene where the actual rescue happens, the actual set piece is incredible. It's uh, it's again Rambo's superior tactics. In this case, it's it's just pure stealth. I mean, boy, I don't know what's worse, coming up against the Predator or coming up against Rambo with sufficient prep time in a jungle. <laughs> in montages. Yeah. <laughs> the, and I just will always adore that super iconic scene where he twists that little grenade arrow top on. Yeah. <laughs> just nails like four guys with it across the river it's gorgeous yeah. Perfect. well and and as you said there is fantastic action set pieces the helicopter chase in this is mm-hmm. 
phenomenally well shot. You know, the director George um, George P. Cosmatos, for a variety of reasons. Um, what's interesting is I at this point for younger people, he might be just known as the dad of the guy who directed Mandy, <laughs> which is always like a fun little tidbit. But um, I mean, the film that he does after this is Cobra, which is also another like phenomenal action 80s action film um mostly for all the wrong ways but um cobra wanted a knife belt buckle my whole life ah uh, cobra is, is that is sylvester stallone at, pe- at the peak of his ego yeah. um <laughs> so cosmatos nail i i think for the most part nails the the action directing i mean i don't think he's given as much as we as sylvester stallone has become a better screenwriter with time and as much as people tend to love james cameron especially at that time period james cameron is a hell of a screenwriter you know and i, I don't know what what they were writing here uh, you know was it a four-page story because that's kind of what it feels like and that's it's, kind it's, of my problem with yeah story. and part of the part of the problem right wrong or indifferent is inherent to the character of john rambo because they were trying to keep him consistent and the dude is definitely sympathetic and he's definitely a likable character as far as it goes but he's not a font of personality no and yeah absolutely right he's not he's not this this arc of personality or anything like that we enjoy watching him win because he does feel you know especially because if you've seen the first one he feels like the every man who just happens to have the right stuff, you know, to be this badass. And, you know, in this film, you start to see that to leave. You start to see that he does start to have those kind of, like you said, he has a grenade arrow that he shoots and he blows a guy up. He tricks a guy in a helicopter by pretending to be dead in a helicopter at the very end, which is still a strange plot convenience. (laughs) As if the person in the helicopter can see inside the helicopter and be like, yep, his eyes are closed. He's dead. <laughs> but the, I mean, that's what this movie does. It's got a lot of flaws. I, you know, I have a lot of issues with this film. I will say it's entertaining. You know, I'll give it that much. So much fun. I, once again, John Williams nails the score. The cinematography is great. The use of the jungle is fantastic. There's some great shots. Anything that's on like the, the pirate boat that those sequences on the pirate boats because they use these pirates to kind of boat down the river all of those are wonderfully shot over the water and the explosions and everything so um, there's a lot of things to love about this being into the american base and unloading an entire machine gun clip into nothing again <laughs> well he unloads it into the machinery to be fair yeah right the cover but of the, then, the computers yeah but then pinning Murphy down and stabbing the knife right next to his head that is another just quintessential 80s action shot oh yeah absolutely because he he does it and and of course there's like these close-up shots of of his face like sweating really badly the the villain and then as he's doing it he's like mission accomplished and he like nails the knife right in the side of it and you're like yeah yeah that's pretty cool so i'm gonna choose a bad stallone quote from this one it's gonna be uh murdoch i'm coming for you (laughs) yeah it, it doesn't doesn't quite get to as ridiculous as say the next film it uh certainly does touch on it so you know transition yeah i was gonna say but all in all rambo first blood part two i think is a very entertaining film it does transition this franchise further into action territory down to some of the cliches and weak writing points but it is entertaining and i think cosmatos nails a lot of those those key action sequences for it to be you know a a film that i like to put on in the background as i'm doing laundry or something like that so we're gonna go to rambo three where they really just kill the naming scheme (laughs) What happened to Rambo 2? Rambo, no Rambo Blood two. Part 2 is a clunky title, but at least there's a logic to it. Rambo 3 is just throwing your hands in the air and giving up. Guess everybody <laughs> was calling it Rambo anyway. Yeah. So, in Thailand, Rambo has found a life, if not of peace, what with the stick fighting, at least one of quiet. Until Troutman seeks him out to assist with a training mission in Afghanistan to teach the Mujahideen rebels how to fight the rapidly encroaching Russians. Rambo refuses and Troutman goes alone, but before long he's captured and Rambo agrees to go on a rescue mission for his old friend from the insane Russian commander Zayson. What follows is 
fairly nonstop action scenes capped with Rambo stealing a tank and playing the most unhinged game of chicken ever filmed against a Russian hind helicopter. Uh, notorious for having the highest on, or I think nowadays it's actually one of the one of the highest on screen kill counts in film history. Yeah, yeah, Rambo three. Okay, so <laughs> boy, yeah. there's a, there's a lot here. There uh, is a lot, and this is one of the this is the first time. Um, okay, so so you dug into the plot a little bit. Let's take let's go. Let's we'll go back to the themes. Let's go back to the themes about you know veterans and stuff like that. They're not here. Maybe, that theme has now been lost. The thread there. Yep. Yep, and now Rambo has become essentially a glorified white savior. Worse than that, he's a cartoon character at this point, literally and figuratively. Oh, and so, yeah, going into this opening sequence, I this opening sequence is both outstanding and terrible at the same time because you are reintroduced to Rambo, who is now is sporting his iconic red bandana, which he got in the second one, which is from his, his 30-second dead girlfriend's outfit. Mm-hmm. Right, that's where he gets the red, the red bandana. So this is this is where the, this movie has the red bandana, more iconic, and the jade pendant that he wears from her. It's funny that it's the third film in the franchise because literally every stereotype you associate with the Rambo franchise is from this movie. Absolutely, and that's sort of this opening sequence where he has this stick fight. So we've come to realize he's a monk. Mm-hmm. Like he's living in in a in a temple in Thailand. I mean, he kind of has a peaceful life. You get the idea that maybe he's a carpenter or he's a fix it man or something to that effect. He only stick fights to bring money into the monastery. Yep, he stick fights to bring money in the monastery. But it's it's hilarious because, like as I mentioned before, so in Rambo One, Sylvester Stallone is pretty gaunt. He's pretty thin. Looks more. I mean, he's fit. He's incredibly fit and muscular, but he's more of a normal person Two, they put him in a rock quarry. They kind of beef him up a little bit because you know, it's 1985 now and uh, people need to be big. Arnold Schwarzenegger is getting really huge, both as a film star and as a person. Um, <laughs> so he's a very large man. So you have that. And then, so by this one, Sylvester Stallone is, I mean, he's got like a 17 pack in this, like he's so incredibly muscular and large. He's so muscular that he is a cartoon character. This was an era where he was crazy jacked because you can also look at uh, Rocky 3 and 4 as yeah. well. Like, just this entire era, he was so ripped. Like you said, 17-pack abs for sure. Yeah, he's got, like, abs on abs that, like, go up past his ribs. I'm pretty sure he's got some on his neck. It's weird. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he's become this cartoon character. They do, especially this, as- is where they, this is where they do that famous shot of him tightening the bandana yeah. and you see his back muscles rippling and it's in his back muscles bigger than my goddamn head. <laughs> dude, I've got like inches on the dude height wise. <laughs> yeah. And it's, and it's funny because the, I can't blame the movie for having this opening sequence because this is exactly what they want Rambo to be, which is this heroic, silent, incredibly muscular fit monk. He's become this caricature of like, I am righteous and thoughtful, and I'm also can in, kick ass at the drop of a pin, right? Yeah. Which literally is what happens in this movie. <laughs> yeah. You know, he he. You know, that being said, like he gets he gets brought in by his good old friend Troutman, you know, and he ends up going to Afghanistan. Unfortunately, the only real air quote lesson in the movie is historical and unintended. Which uh, heroically depicts us arming the eventual Taliban. <laughs> yeah, this is a film that and it ties the, right, right. It's a movie that's a little awkward to watch in a post nine eleven world. It <laughs> is what it is, and its place in history exists. And you know the socio economic and political situation there is more complicated than I'm making it. But for the sake of brevity it is still something that's kind of impossible to ignore. Yeah. Nowadays you can't ignore it. This is a movie that's incredibly dated because of things like that. And, you know, it's interesting because this movie, he does make, so this movie, if we we're going into the themes of this franchise, he does make one interesting comment um, to the Russians once he's captured and the Russians are there. And 
he makes the comment that you're making the same mistake America did in Vietnam. Like these people will not give up and you're going to lose. Yeah. You know, and that's kind of an interesting parallel to make. It's not really a theme as much as it is kind of like a throwaway moment. But it's worth it does show Rambo as somebody who respected his enemy, which is it, it fits right in with the little warrior monk arc they gave him in this movie, which you're completely right about. Yeah. Right. And then, yeah, he's yeah, he's become this warrior monk. And I don't know if this movie for me. It's entertaining. I'll give it that. I Again, it's got a lot of things to like about it. I think the cinematography and the use of the desert, obviously a change of pace from uh, the foggy, you know, pine forests of, of the U.S. And then the jungles of the second one, you have this brand new, you know, setting. I think the use of the desert setting is rather unique. I think it's well shot in a and lot of ways. If, uh, if any of our listeners out there have not seen this movie... Do not just take my word for it. It is worth watching at the very least for how amazingly gratuitous its kill count actually is. And do not let me underemphasize how amazing it is to see Rambo shoot a dude, steal a tank, and single-handedly drive this tank like a maniac at a fucking helicopter. Um the helicopter right at a friggin helicopter it's it's unbelievable and in the best possible use of that word this is also a movie that at the time was the most expensive film ever made Hmm. yeah um which you know nowadays seems like you know pretty pennies but it was a 63 million dollar budget yeah so this is a movie that you know it was incredibly expensive but what's interesting about it is that they do put it up all on screen and i mean even like the miniature of stone yeah yeah or the use of horses Mm -hmm. there's a lot of like horse stunts which are not cheap yeah so um in terms of the franchise, I think this one is, you know, it's thematically even weaker than the first two. Uh, you know, it just doesn't. It's got some interesting new ideas that it's trying to bring into oh, the fold. It, and it's absolutely worth mentioning. We're, we're kind of speaking with uh, 30 years advantage on it. But, you know, we, we know the cultural impact and we can revere it a little bit on that level. Make no mistake, this movie was eviscerated when it came out critically. Oh, rightfully so (laughs) so i cannot i i cannot uh wrong that so rolling right along like a tank through a helicopter what (laughs) would you say that the fourth film rambo is about (laughs) so yeah leaping in here we are the fourth film rambo again with the worst titling structure for franchise ever rambo comes out in 2008 so we are talking oh is that that 20 years 20 years after the third one yep. um 20 years difference in this rambo tells the story of john rambo 20 years down the road it takes place in kind of a real time in those regards he has gone back to thailand he is living a very simple life as as a boatsman <laughs> essentially who's who helps out people in in the area he is at this point hired to take a group of, you know, missionaries. Yeah. Missionaries. Yeah. Human service workers in those returns, take a group of missionaries um, out to an area in Burma so that they can do some humanitarian efforts. I mean, that's kind of the gist of the story. This, this movie also does not have a very complex story. He takes them into uh, this area for the humanitarian effort in the process, they get attacked by pirates. He dispatches them in true Rambo style. And then at that point, they are disgusted by this man. And they're like, we do not need your services anymore. Despite all of the warnings he gives of being somebody who lives in the area and understands the the dangers of what is going to happen pretty soon. Uh, these uh, missionaries are in trouble. And, uh, you know, Rambo once again has been called to bring the war to the villains to save the underdog and uh that's kind of the gist of rambo what i think's kind of interesting about the story structure here is that it kind of of all the damn movies recalls rambo 2 in the sense that he 
is actually brought back into the situation as a guide for a group of mercenaries that's going in to rescue the and to rescue the missionaries. Well, that's a lot of M words. And boy, these mercenaries suck. So <laughs> I have to step in and kind of fix the situation. Notable things about this movie. Boy, it may not have the kill count of Rambo 3, but it is violent. Like, even from a gorehound perspective, it is, like, shockingly visceral. Yeah, and so I love this movie. <laughs> Just to put it straightforward, I'm especially after watching, especially, like, in preparation for this, you know, I knock out these films. I watch them bang, 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 all in a row, right? Mm-hmm. And after the the ridiculousness and cartoonishness of Rambo 3, Rambo feels like a breath of fresh air because it is once again very serious. It's very dark. It's very gritty. And it's interesting that where they take John Rambo's character. And this kind of goes into the history of this film, right? Like as this film was being prepped, Sylvester Stallone notoriously said, you know, for years and years that he had no desire to return back to the John Rambo character. There was nothing left for that character to do for him that interested him uh, for years and years. And he had to find the right story. At this point, this is the first time you actually hear about the story about him rescuing a young girl in Mexico, Mm -hmm. which will come up here in a few minutes. But this is the first time you hear that, and that he thought that that was an interesting concept, but it just fit with what he thought was Rambo. The film franchise gets sold a couple of times. The original owners of the franchise at that point had gone out of business. The film ends up going to a bunch of different companies, finally ending up at New Image and Millennium Films. For those of you who follow action films, you'll know New Image and Millennium Films as basically Canon Films 2.0. They love to make kind of medium budget action films and try to deliver on those promises and so and this uh, film is birthed from that it's birthed from this idea of of going to a canon films kind of company and uh one credit i will give the movie is that part of why stallone agreed to the film in the first place was to help shed light on the burmese genocide which is a major setting of the movie um i think that's really really noble I'm not strictly sure mowing down half of Myanmar was the best way to get that message across, <laughs> but kind of props for that too, to actually have one of these movies be about something again. It, and it really is the, I mean, we talked a little bit about, you know, Rambo first blood part two, having, you know, an extension of the themes of the first one, but this film actually feels like it takes a lot of the core concepts of, of John Rambo as a character of what the original film stood for in those regards of like fighting for the underdog, you know, fighting the good fight and extending it to a modern age. i um, talking, like you said, about the Burmese genocide and Rambo has this classic line about, you know, you have to live for something or you die for nothing. Yeah. And it's interesting to see his character refined that in this movie, that belief. And I think that's what makes this movie for me work is that unlike first blood part two and Rambo three, this is the, this is the first movie since first blood for me where I feel like John Rambo's character arc feels legitimate. So speaking of character arcs, clumsy transition, (laughs) speaking of character arcs or lack thereof. (laughs) Yeah. Here's not that. We are going to just barrel headlong into Rambo, Last Blood. At least we're back on title cohesion. I'll give it that much. I think this is a great title. It's a good title. Last Blood, it invokes the original one, First Blood, Last Blood, you know? And believe me, I'm about to have a lot of strong opinions on this movie. But, uh, well, you know, we'll, we'll just get into it. We'll get into it. I really didn't like this. So (laughs) rolling in, just barreling straight into it. In Texas, Rambo's found a life for himself, a quiet one, if not one of peace. What with uh, him still, (laughs) they, they gave him a new affect where he digs holes now. So, you know, he's keeping busy and he's taken over his father's ranch and has built several relationships for himself 
including and especially his niece Gabriella, who wants to go to Mexico to track down her deadbeat father. Against John's advice, she heads south of the border, where she's immediately disappointed by her terrible, terrible father, sold out by her best friend, and locked up in a brothel. John goes to rescue her and is caught and savagely beaten by the cartel holding her. Gabriella is assaulted and murdered by drug overdose as punishment for John trying to save her. And from there, the film basically is a simple revenge story. John kills the cartel baddie's brother and then draws the rest of kind of the cartel soldiers to his home that he set up with elaborate violent traps. Cartel is killed and Rambo rides into the sunset, literally, on a horse. So. (laughs) Okay, so... You know what I want to do? I want to do with this film. I'm going to start off with the things I like. That's a short list. It's a bold choice, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna take a swing for the rafters, and we're going to talk a little bit about the things I like about Rambo: Last Blood. Number one, I like that they went back to a desert setting. I think we went jungle desert, jungle desert. <laughs> in this franchise. So we're kind of going back and forth. I like the idea that it does take place in the American Southwest because he does make a mention in Rambo 3 that he was originally from Arizona. Mm-hmm. And at the end of Rambo, he goes back home to visit his father at the ranch. Sorry, I did. I said Texas and it is Arizona. You're right. Oh, is it Arizona? Okay. It does take so, place. Yes. So yeah. So he goes back home. So I like the idea of him coming back home. Because we've gotten this idea of that he's this, again, white savior narrative where he goes into places and kind of kicks some ass and, you know, saves people. And I like that they brought this one back home because it does in concept that brings everything full circle. Another thing I will give it is in the modern era to see this particular style of action movie violence is kind of a breath of fresh air when the action does happen which is tragically infrequent but when the action does happen in this movie it is swift violent and memorable i can't remember everything that happened in this movie it's definitely not a great movie but boy every action scene sticks out yeah and i i agree i think the final act in the tunnels as as you mentioned as strange as the tunnels are in concept (laughs) this idea of him being a survivalist is brought back even though it's less about survival tactics and more about home alone meets jigsaw tactics in a lot of ways of of how he uses these tunnels but the violence in those that sequence i i'll give it to you it's incredibly almost exploitative to an extent where i don't think that the fourth film rambo went to uh the you know the fourth film rambo is incredibly violent and gritty. I mean, there's the sequence where he has the the gun on the back of the Jeep, which is like horrifically violent in the fourth one. And this one tries to match that in a lot of ways. 60 at point blank range. Yeah, that movie is <laughs> horrifying. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I do agree. I think that the use of, of you know, of the hard R rating and the violence um, in terms of his survival skills in the last act is really interesting. I do, I do appreciate that. I also think there's a really interesting concept in this film that in his pseudo retirement, he's become a person who breaks horses. Mm-hmm. And I think that's an interesting parallel of a man who was, you know, thrown through some of the worst things of the army, these, these cover-ups and these thrown into the worst places. Like he is a person, he was a horse that was broken. Mm-hmm. You know, and this idea that he breaks horses. I think there's an interesting idea there that this film does not utilize (laughs) at all. (laughs) There's no thematic weight to that whatsoever, but there's an inkling of an idea there that I do appreciate. There's also, I think, an intentional parallel in its effort to sort of be a Western. However... And it's got a very Shane-like ending that I just don't believe is accidental. No, not at all. I, I agree. It's We talked about in, in just a few minutes ago when we talked about Rambo, that the original story for the fourth Rambo film was to him to go to Mexico to rescue a girl, which is the plot for this film. And it does feel, even when the first trailer came out, I thought to myself, this is Sylvester Stallone. He wanted to make a Western, and the only way he could actually make one was to put Rambo on the title. 
Yeah. So, and there's certainly that feeling. I will uh, dive right into what I feel are some of the biggest problems with this movie. Starting with, it's got the plot of a very deathly serious traffic-like drama and does not have the thematic or cinematic weight to carry it. This movie does not have the gravitas to pull off the scene where Gabrielle is uh, assaulted and tortured to death. It just doesn't. It's horrible to watch and not in that typical way that we seek out as genre fans. It's just bad and it's incongruous with the rest of the film. You know, you can't take a franchise that had its height as a literal cartoon in both senses of the phrase and then do a plot line where a girl is forced to be addicted to heroin and, you know, murdered like that. It's just not, it doesn't work. Well, and I think you bring up a good point is that we've seen films like that. We've seen, you know, to a lesser extent, take it. We've seen, you know, things that, that have that same plot um, or similar plot. And I think even though we just, we just literally spent the last, whatever, 30, 40 minutes talking about different Rambo films and talking about that. And the difference between this one versus any of the other ones is that this one doesn't feel like a Rambo film. And I think that that's part of it. It's going into this plot where it is dark and gritty, and I and I don't mind that. I think that that's a it's a bold choice. But there's never a part in this movie where I felt like this was John Rambo. And this is coming from where we just watched Rambo three, <laughs> and Rambo three Rambo's a caricature of John Rambo. You know, he has ceased to be even a character. And in this one, he's a completely different character. And I think that's a really, really important point. That you take a character, and this isn't even talking about, you know, my cinematic issues. Like, strictly a character problem for me is you take a character who was so stealthy and so smart, he has taken out no less than three full military regiments across three films mostly using stealth tactics and such and you take that and you have him be bamboozled by a cartel watcher with a burner phone no two and more significant issue with that particular scene is even if you do buy that you know rambo would just be out and out caught like that Now you're trying to set up this horrifying, violent cartel that leaves John alive for any goddamn reason when they have him dead to rights like that. It it is beyond my capacity for suspension of disbelief. And I watch some really stupid shit. (laughs) Well, and I agree because this movie is trying to present itself as a as kind of a return to a more realistic tone. You know, by having something that's really topical as cartels and, you know, human trafficking, you know, across over the over the border, there's those are very topical subjects right now. And this film mishandles them at pretty much every step of the way, including, you know, I mentioned in, in as we were talking about the fourth film Rambo, that one of the themes that I like about this is that about these films is that Rambo has always been a fighter for the underdog, whether it's himself in the first film um, or prisoners of war in the second film, the uh, resistance against the Russian army in the third film, or these missionaries in the, in the fourth, this film, you don't get that, you know? And, and when it does present these kind of underdog, like these, um, the, nice uh, Mexican people that help him out, the journalist and the doctor, they're presented as characters. They have no relevance to the story. It's a film where he's not fighting for the underdog. He's fighting for revenge. And that's never been something that this franchise has ever touched on. And not that I'm against things being new added to a franchise, but I do feel like it, this is a franchise that is very loosely held together by some very basic themes. And this last film betrays almost all of them. Although, if I may take one moment to backpedal 
and give my one significant compliment to the movie. And it is a full-on no-breaks compliment, which is uh, one of the few themes it did hold on to was the theme of PTSD. And I actually appreciate that this movie makes it explicit that John got help for that. Um, He's on medication. He actually expressly isn't embarrassed by it, and it's not shown as a weakness for him. And I think that's a very important message. And uh, despite the fact that this film is otherwise a dumpster fire, I do honestly appreciate that specific aspect. Absolutely. I fully agree with that. And I'm glad that you brought that up because it is important. And it's probably the one John Rambo thing in this film. (laughs) (laughs) And I think what's interesting is that moving, you know, I don't, it, I guess, is there anything more you wanted to say about Last Blood before we kind of about it wrap this up? Nah, we can, I'm, I'm definitely good to roll into the franchise as a whole because we're already kind of touching on those themes because it's, if we're talking about Last Blood in a strict vacuum, just as a movie, It's a poorly paced, poorly handled, confused, clumsy mess that doesn't work. And the things that do work are absolutely in fits and spurts. So it's already just inherently more interesting to talk about in terms of the franchise. Although, as a contrast, it's not a good one. For a a franchise that spent most of its time in the critics' crosshairs... It's the only out-and-out bad movie in the franchise, I think. Yeah, I would agree. And I think that to add insult to injury for Rambo Last Blood is the fact that I feel like the fourth Rambo ended really nicely. Him going home. Going home, yeah. Actually, it's the first time he'd been stepped foot back in America since Rambo 2. Yeah. Yeah, since he was since he got out of prison, <laughs> and and he went home and he was going home to visit his father's farm, and I feel like that was a really good fit it, fitting ending for the franchise, and so for them to come in, part of the specific theme of that is, was also uh, fathers. Actually, it it is a it is a theme of Rambo Four, not one we particularly touched on because it's not a heavy or major theme. You could almost call it more uh, a character arc setup. Yeah, but uh, it does mention his father, and it does contrast it against uh, Julie Benz's father, her her character's father. Which, for what it's worth, uh, Julie Benz was actually really good in that movie too. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and that's a fair shake. So, and and I think that's what's interesting because Rambo Four is is such a good end of the franchise that when they added this on, and then it doesn't look the same. It's it's a western. It's very much a western in tone. It's a revenge film. Yes. And it's it feels almost like a betrayal to the franchise. And and this is coming I'm I'm all for weird franchises and things like that. And I think I would be okay with it if we had time to make another one. Mhm. You know, if they were going to make another one, which they probably won't because Last Blood did not have great box office blowback. But if they were going to make another one, you could rectify some of the things because you can have a bad entry. And then if you have a good entry, I mean, there's so many franchises that survive on that, right? It's not like one bad entry can, you know, makes a bad franchise, but, you know, Grace didn't have a good entry until the fifth one. (laughs) Right, exactly. And so, you know, it's just at this time because Sylvester, of Sylvester Stallone's age, which he very much shows his age in this film in, in Last Blood, that I don't think we're going to get one where it feels like it's a good cap to the franchise like we already got with Rambo. And I feel like that's kind of an insult to injury. That's a little bit of salt in the wound for me as a fan of this franchise and as somebody who grew up with this, who grew up with Rambo as an iconic character. Um, of America and of like the eighties and of pop culture, this is kind of what we got. And it's a, in a lot of ways, a very, very significant betrayal of the character as well. Rambo has always had tactic and stealth, but he's not jigsaw. He wasn't like a torture trap kind of guy. And 
part of the thing that was always interesting for what was such a stereotypically violent movie series is Rambo always had to be pushed to violence. Um, it's not, they always argue that it was not his natural state until this movie, which completely retcons everything to force it to work within its narrative. But every single movie of the franchise, every single one, violence is not his first choice. I mean, that's the, literally the title of the first film. Yeah. They drew first blood. This was just my reaction, right? Yep. And and again and again, and it's somebody who else who asks him to do something. It's not like he's out looking for a fight. Nope. You know, and, and to an extent, I guess, Last Blood, like this idea that, you know, it's his... It's uh, this young woman that goes down to Mexico that kind of indicates it. But after she dies, he does go out for blood. It's him hunting him down. And it's, I don't know, it just doesn't, I think you're absolutely right. It just doesn't work. Well, and it's another, uh, it's a price of revenge movie that never really shows the price of revenge. Like, and yet again, here we have another young woman in the Rambo franchise getting fridged just for motivation. Absolutely. And yeah, which happens way too often in like movies. And it's funny because there's, I have a lot of, I have a lot of cinema friends who actually really liked last blood. They liked that. It felt like a seventies exploitation film. And, and again, as you kind of said, even in a vacuum, there's something to be said about it in those regards. You know, I still don't think it's the movies impressive when he's interrogating that guy and he just like rips or breaks that collarbone and kind of rips it up through the shoulder. Like that is a horrifying effect. I loved it. Yeah. But in, in terms of, you know, like what this podcast is meant to do to look at something as a franchise, I think glass blood is, is a significant failure and in so many ways and even on its own and like you said in a vacuum i don't think it's necessarily a successful film i it's i don't think it's stallone on his a game it's not even stallone on i mean the fourth film rambo he does a pretty good job in and it's not he's not even close to that uh it feels like a money grab at some point it feels like maybe that stallone was um aiming to earn a little bit of cash for his new company Mm -hmm. uh that is which i i'm all for his new company but you know making you know mid-budget action films i'm all for it but like at at the expense of of this film i don't know i don't know if that was worth it Uh, my uh my my final word before we move into uh the franchise analysis at least personally is i would have really 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 preferred the version they were pitching where he was going to fight a genetically altered super monster in the jungle (laughs) <laughs> which, which is also so weird. Like, how do you pitch that as a Rambo film? Jesus. Yeah, there was no, there was literally no version of Rambo Five that sounded good. But at least that one was delightfully insane. Yeah, versus this one just being nihilistically insane. But so, yeah, um, I don't think you can enter any discussion about Rambo without bringing up the only obvious like in your face Mack truck of a theme, which is of course military and our treatment of veterans. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what's really interesting about this franchise as a whole, as we start to look at it through all of these is that as time goes on, we actually see the, the franchise change with how America feels in terms of politics and social values and things like that, including how it treats its military. You know, that's why the first one still remains the best one is that it's a film that is really thoughtful about it. And as it goes on, especially as the eighties went on and we started really getting into, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the me movement, this idea of like me first, you know, these really, well, I think to me, uh, not to, Sorry, not to spike your point at all, but I think to me what happened was in the early 80s, we were still riding on that post-70s nihilism from the extremely failed war in Vietnam. Whereas by the time we're rolling into First Blood Part Two and Rambo, we've hit this point where we 
are still annoyed with our military brass because of things like the Iran-Contra affair and such. But we swung back to a pro-military uh, sensibility in pop culture. The idea of Russians and terrorists and all these bad guys. And in the 80s, we had, you know, Rambo, G.I. Joe. Christ, Rambo had a G.I. Joe-like cartoon where he had karate commandos. Like... I, I've referenced it a few times, but, you know, bringing it up directly, like, it, this was this weird point in the 80s where all these R-rated hard franchises were getting children's cartoons, and it was okay, because <laughs> we were very, very rah-rah-rah against Russia. It was very, very much a propaganda movement. Like we kind of mentioned, even so much as Rambo 3 is literally built on the framework of the very real story of us arming the Mujahideen against the Russians. Uh, much as that came back to bite us, uh, you know, obviously they thought it was the right choice at the time because we were trying to fight communism at every step, basically. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. You actually, that was exactly what I was trying to say. You just said it 10 times better than I could ever say it. Um, that the, the way that the franchise evolves follows kind of what, what the American culture was doing. And I think that's why Rambo as a character became such an icon of American culture. He represented the strength of America against the Russians by, by the time that first blood part two and by the time Rambo three came out. And that's an interesting move, particularly as you said, as the, as the viewpoint towards uh, American soldiers and the military changed, you know, sure. We didn't, we didn't like the bureaucracy of the military and we Rambo shoots up computers and, and gives them the middle finger all the time. But there was this idea that that was, that was the American way, right? We do it. Even if we have to break a few rules, we're going to get it right because we are just in well, what we are doing. How many, uh, think about how that affected us in a cultural sense. Uh, like you mentioned, the, the Gen X and the you know, older millennials and kind of our generation and how we look at this stuff. Like We do still see Rambo as basically just and you know um we did hit this kind of damn the man point but how many people in our generation have you heard use some variation of the phrase you know um i hate the wars but i respect the soldiers and i really feel like this franchise culturally had at least a finger in that conversation changing well, yeah and absolutely and even as the the franchise modernized because we're talking about the if you know, if we wanted to split it into eras, the first three certainly fit into one area because the second and or the fourth and fifth one take place so much further along after that. And so the fourth and fifth one have a really interesting because it is a post nine eleven communists in four, but that's about as thematically close as it is. Yeah, right. Because he's become almost a rogue. This idea that like he was a again a soldier who was kind of forgotten. Mm -hmm. you know and this idea in four and then which also makes five so perplexing because it's there's really well, nothing about the soldiers that movie is i mean there's nothing specifically rah 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 go america about the movie but again in the political climate we're in there is something kind of uncomfortable about you know white man grabs gun and drives south of border to deliver justice <laughs> right right yeah it certainly has its own political message to deliver uh whether it was intentional or not in those regards but absolutely i think you're right and in this political climate heard of people trying to say you know take politics out of movies or take politics out of this entertainment or take politics out of that we're not a political show and i'm only speaking of politics in terms of how they're treated or used in the movie or my view thereof at least but Movies, media, entertainment, this stuff is inherently political. It just right. is. Well, right. Art art reflects society. Society reflects art. There's a mutual kind of understanding between the two. And I think that that's, it makes it interesting. And that's what makes this franchise really interesting in that ultimately, like I said, when, I, when we first kind of discussed it, I wasn't sure if I wanted to do it. You know, like what could be said about you know, the Rambo franchise that I felt like wasn't necessarily understood. And then the new movie came out and it completely turned it on its head. And it's like, you know what? 
maybe people don't understand this franchise because the people I feel like the people who made Rambo Last Blood, which includes Sylvester Stallone, did not understand what this franchise was and what what made this character such an interesting character. Even if you don't agree with the politics of any of them, it's an interesting reflection of the society that these films were crafted in. And I think that's what makes it. You know, I think that's why it's one of the reasons that, you know, the Rambo franchise is so and iconic in its own way. Even hitting it in terms of broad character arcs, um, up until it crashes on its face in five, the character arc of John Rambo is kind of beautiful and tragic. But it's, as you really drilled on in part four, very complete <laughs> by four. His his arc is told. Five is superfluous in every conceivable sense yeah it's just uh added on for the sake of of whether it be a cash cow or whatever a, a last hurrah for sylvester stallone with the character um it's, it's unnecessary in those regards and you know as much as i love a franchise and give me a thousand entries in every franchise it's that's one of them because this this character has such a unique arc and because of the film is so ingrained into pop culture and american americanisms in its own way that you know, it's weird that the franchise just kind of puttered out. I think we should touch on what that character arc is since it is interesting and strong, fifth one aside. But I actually kind of like the idea that it goes from a man who loves his country so much he wasn't even conscripted. He he volunteered for war. He rose the ranks. He survived it. He came back to a country that hated him. Hated him. He lashes out about it. And is ultimately, you know, imprisoned. And I would even argue rightfully so, given how far he lashed out. But there's definitely a need for sympathy in the situation. I was glad, you know, even in a character arc sense that he's given that chance for redemption as legally bullshit as it probably was. Um, (laughs) And then, you know, you've got a man who, as you said so eloquently, basically keeps fighting for the underdog in all these anti-Russia situations. But, you know, he goes in or he's done with war after he sees how America tries to cover up the soldiers and the POWs and is only convinced back in to rescue his friend. Rambo 3 isn't even necessarily about him joining the mujahideen it's about him it's they're a means to an end for him they kidnapped his friend troutman it's a little it's slightly more personal um he does obviously get embroiled in that conflict and helps resolve it and train the soldiers whatnot but and to have that tie up so nicely in rambo rambo with him basically having shunned society and getting drawn back into it. The idea that maybe it is okay to let people back in. Yeah. After he'd been hurt so many times by society. And what a great theme. What a great film of redemption. You know, like this is a character who consistently like you know fights for the underdog fights for what is just we believe that what he fights for is just even in like rambo the fourth film you know he's kind of a dark character much darker you know as probably as dark as the first film and he still ends up kind of making the right choices he could have just left him you know, the, there's these choices that he's given. And again, bringing back that great quote where it's like, you know, you have to, you can either die for something or, you know, you can either live for something or die for nothing. And he ends up kind of rediscovering that in himself and the, you know, it brings him back home. And I think that's a really interesting, especially in terms of the military and soldiers, like being pro soldier and stuff like that, that that's something that they, you know, that you're believe in. You know, you have to you have to stand for it. And I think that's an interesting theme for this franchise. And and as a character, that makes it really interesting. I mean, I feel like we've touched on a lot of the other themes, uh, whether it's the veterans or soldiers or even just, you know, this idea of conflict overseas. Um, We've touched on a lot of it. I don't know. Is there any other major themes for this franchise you want to touch on? I don't. It's interesting that this, you know, outside of me joking about montages at least a few times <laughs> throughout this this episode, you know, this each film doesn't really have a style necessarily that's inherent to it. I you think know, it's directed by different people. Um, yeah, or all at least co-written by different people. Like 
really, yeah, it's it's a barely cohesive franchise. High highs, but oof. And speaking of high highs and low lows, it's uh, I suppose time that we rank our favorite and least favorite of the franchise. So. Uh, going from worst to best, Matt, what would you say about the franchise in a listical sense? Okay. So I think, again, you said highest, highest of highs, lowest of lows. Obviously I, I like to start at the bottom first. Worst one is handedly number five. Doesn't Mm -hmm. feel like a film of the franchise. It, it exists in its own little bubble. It's, I don't even think a great film on its own merits, unlike some of some of my uh, fellow peers. And I I think thematically it's it's thin and execution wise it's thin. So my number five is going to go to Rambo: Last Blood. Um. Yep. Uh. We're we're at least dead on so far because yeah, Rambo five is really not good just in any but i I don't need to belabor the point any further but in either just a singular or franchise sense this movie's a dumpster fire (laughs) fair enough all right so number four what's your fourth number four rank so i would say my number four is number three (laughs) um rambo three is a very integral part of my childhood and I will always have a certain love for it. But even just revisiting it in research for this, it's really hard to look past the film's flaws of which there are many and not all of them are the historical guffaws I keep bringing up. (laughs) Fair enough. Yeah, uh, for sure. I think for me, my number four has got to be first blood part two. Mm. Um, I and I think the reason why for me that one ranks at my number four, uh, even over three, as you mentioned, um, and and maybe I'll just skip ahead and say my number three is Rambo three. Um, so it's for me it's just uh, slightly different there. But First Blood Part Two is a movie that I think has potential, and does it get anywhere near it outside of the action sequences whereas i feel like three because it's so cartoonish it kind of hits what it was supposed to be yeah and so for me it's going to be rambo 2 as number four number three rambo three for those reasons because first blood part two i just think it's outside of the action sequences i think it's a disappointing story it it carries over some of the themes but it feels like it's a little bit more tacked on to the first film than it is anything new uh at least three has some interesting ideas because of the russians because of the middle east there's some some interesting ideas there uh even if it's incredibly cartoonish and extremely over the top and uh, you know has a um, a mass uh, a fucking careening tank uh, finale. So, although really, really gorgeous setting, definitely shot like it's Lawrence or Arabia with goddamn Rambo in it. <laughs> All right. So, what's your number three then? So my number three is boy. Here's a controversial one. Number four. I really loved Rambo. I love this movie. But it, it's just, to me, a really, really good action movie with its heart in the right place, although its head kind of up its ass, as a message movie. And then if we're talking pure action spectacle, like there's two really solid set pieces, and otherwise it's a little more slow-paced. Not to the movie's fault, but just in what me personally looks for in something like this you know it's fine all right so i guess that means i will roll straight to my number two which is first blood part two Uh, the thing about this movie is that yes for all the reasons you said there are it's pretty flawed but it's kind of flawed in that beautiful James Cameron action movie way where even its flaws are kind of strengths because we're looking back on it now. And at the time, a lot of the stuff was novel. The idea, the idea of the one man army really doesn't predate this movie. 
um, the one man army as we see it in a more modern sense. And again, it's small stuff. Like I like the fact that it's not an out and out him running in with a machine gun kind of thing. Like every contact with the enemy he has is in the dark and it's in shadow. And, you know, he sneaks up and, you know, he gets one guy out and gets chewed out for it, but he sneaks up and get this one guy out. And then he sneaks up and he kills this whole line of, (laughs) uh, uh, I guess they're still NVA soldiers, technically. Russians, ultimately, really. <laughs> yeah, right. Russians are behind them. So, uh, <laughs> because, you know, 1985. Yeah, exactly. So, ultimately, it's just the, to me, it's not the best movie of the franchise. And anybody that can do math knows what my number one is by <laughs> elimination. But uh, it's not the best movie in the franchise, but it is. By God, the most Rambo movie in the franchise. That's a fair assessment. I actually, I don't mind that at all. So um, my number two is Rambo, the fourth film. I, for me, I, I totally understand where you're coming from in terms of your criticisms of the film. I really do like it. I feel like it's a, a great finale for the series, even if it wasn't the finale for the series. And um I really like where they take the character of John Rambo. I like that he has to find faith in humanity again. And I think that's a really interesting thing after all of the shit that everyone puts him through in these first the first three films that he eventually just has to, you know, find it in himself to kind of forgive and that allows him to go home. And I think that kind of a message and that kind of a theme um makes it interesting. I agree outside of five i think in terms of action set pieces sylvester stallone as a director is not the best at shooting the action set pieces there's a lot of shaky cam in these things it's pretty dark at times but um it also kind of adds to the grittiness of that film and i i really appreciate it for it so my number two is going to be rambo I'm going to jump in here real quick to throw one fast shout out to rambo for uh villain game of throwing landmines in a marsh and forcing prisoners to run through it. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah, it's tense. <laughs> Sorry. It's it's apropos of nothing, but I just felt like it had to be said at some point. Like that is <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that's that's all fair game in this podcast, right? So <laughs> um all right. So I think by that process of elimination pretty obvious i mean this it's not even really uh to me up for any kind of debate or discussion like uh, first blood is a great movie like literal all-time great movie yeah i agree i i said it before when we first started talking about this franchise that i think first blood is is not only the best of this franchise i also think it's one of the best action movies ever made uh the realism it works for me i like i like there's a scene where the cop car rolls down the hill and it's like the slowest roll down the hill you're like you're so used to like cars just like flipping down like doing 100 miles an hour it doesn't explode (laughs) no and it doesn't explode then the sheriff gets out and he starts like yelling and shaking his fist it's great because there's like a realism to it that really kind of hits home for its message messages and things like that like we said um even his only kill in the movie is a guy firing a goddamn sniper rifle at him from a helicopter and all he does is throw the rock at him to throw a rock at him to throw his aim off it's not his fault the helicopter pilot jerks the helicopter to the left and knocks him out yep yeah it's I don't know. I just think first blood is an incredible film it's an incredible feat of filmmaking Sylvester mm-hmm. Stallone deserves an award for that era of his of his acting and i think the between the messages in it the themes that it's aiming for the the incredible action set pieces even though by today's standards they're not necessarily like full-out action set pieces there's a lot of chase scenes but i just think it's a it's an incredibly well-rounded film and outside of that final song (laughs) <laughs> it's probably a perfect film um for me anyway so so i guess recapping mine goes first blood rambo rambo three first blood part two and last blood whereas mine would be first blood 
First Blood Part 2, Rambo, Rambo 3, and also Last Blood. Last Blood, last place. Very yes. fitting. All right, so I would call that another successful episode of No Franchise Fatigue. That's right. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you're listening along, watch along. Again, um, feel free to share with us what your rankings of the Rambo franchise are. You know, we went through all five of them this episode. Thank you for sticking around with us. It was a long episode. Um, you know, we try to we try to have less films in it, but this kind of feel felt like it was right. So um, go ahead. Like I said check us out you can reach us uh both sean and i right over at blood brothers film reviews dot uh you can reach sean over at uh, his email which is nffpod dot s-e-a-n at gmail.com that's nffpod dot sean at gmail.com you can reach us on twitter and the facebook page we are under no franchise fatigue podcast uh you're welcome to uh reach out to us that way like us follow us uh you can uh check out our back catalog over at anchor uh anchor who is our sponsor uh here they're uh wonderful hosts that have been uh working with us on this so you can uh, listen to us on spotify and anywhere else that you find your podcast so um wow uh, we're coming up uh at the end of the year now i'm sure at some point you know, maybe we'll be doing kind of a best of the year list. Mm-hmm. I think maybe we should. We should. Mm-hmm. I like lists, Sean. I think we should do more lists, Sean. People like lists. People like lists. I like lists. Checking them twice, maybe. It's Checking the them twice. <laughs> it is the season. But uh, of course, that will uh, will be coming back with another episode of No Franchise Fatigue uh, for the next month. We're going to be tackling a horror Sweet. franchise. Holiday season. Holiday season, right? Let it snow. Let it bleed. Something, something. I don't know. That joke just couldn't finish itself. Uh, we're going to be tackling the Black Christmas franchise. Def- definitely a very strange franchise because there's actually no sequels involved. Yeah. It's a franchise of remakes. It's fascinating. <laughs> it's a franchise of remakes. Um, so hopefully we'll be covering, uh, of course, the original Black Christmas, the uh, first remake, which was um, stylized yeah. as Black Xmas uh, in, in terms of uh, finding it. So most places actually have it listed under Black Xmas instead of Black Christmas. And then, of course, the new one, which is uh, coming out this December 13th, uh, which is called Black Christmas. Uh, Blumhouse is bringing us a new version of the classic slasher. So hopefully we'll be able to tackle all three. Yeah. And uh, yeah, <laughs> until then. <laughs> until then until, until then calling from inside the house somebody's calling from inside the house yeah so um you know thank you for joining us uh once again have a great evening and uh you know keep up keep up with the franchises guys thanks